All right, so yeah, what section? We're running now in section 35, which is ensemble methods, right? So um, yeah, so we talked about, was it last time was uh, random forest, right? Or no, it's not random forest, decision trees, right? So ensemble methods really works really well. Um, it's a great transition to, um, from decision trees to, ran, um, to ensemble methods because essentially decision trees are really great, but they have some disadvantages. Like I might have mentioned, towards the end of the last study group is um, one is that they just um, tend to overfit. Like they're almost like in a sense, like too good. They're too good at like learning all this information and stuff like this. So there's ways we can kind of circumvent that by hyperparameter tuning, but even then decision trees just tend to overfit. And it'd be nice a way to kind of like be able to enhance it or use a really decent, you know, um, model um, and kind of enhance it or, you know, what we'll call like boosting and stuff like this. Um, so one way we can do this is to basically say, um, create many different models and put them together. And I heard this great analogy for this that I think works well for ensemble methods is it's kind of like if you could take a test with all your friends. And so there's kind of two ways you can kind of do this. One is that you say, okay, like everyone's kind of like, we call these like weak learners. So like imagine like, you know, like these are students like, you know, like they're not gonna do perfect on the test. Um, but hopefully like the wisdom of the crowd kind of does a decent job. So essentially you go through each of the questions, like to say it's multiple choice and essentially all the different, like the whole class votes on what they think the answer is. And so the idea there is that even though maybe one person doesn't know all the answers is that hopefully collectively you would perform well, um, by basically having many people have their vote in there. So many people's gaps of knowledge are kind of like, um, like maybe people's gaps of knowledge, um, are what's it called? compensated with people's knowledge, right? And so the idea that you combine people together. And this is something that we call bagging, where basically we have um, an aggregation of essentially a bunch of weak learners to create a super learner, right? Which will be our ensemble method um, or an ensemble machine mo model. Um, another strategy you can have is something called closer to what we'll call boosting. But um, the idea here is like, instead of going off of like, you know, everyone has an equal vote. Um, instead of what you say is like, okay, like, you know, you, you know, person A, you are really good at like um, history. Like you're gonna answer all the history questions, you know, and we're gonna, we're gonna emphasize your questions, but you're gonna get some of those other questions wrong that are not history. So the ones that are not history, you know, you're really good at philosophy and you're really good at math and you're really good at science. And we're gonna answer those questions depending on who you are kind of deal. So the idea here is that each learner, they're weak learners still, but each learner would have different like um, capabilities and then their flaws are kind of like, um, pointed out so that other learners can kind of take up the slack. And so the idea there is that you don't have to be good at all the information, but you can be good at very select information and, and doing that part. And so you can already see there's a kind of a uh, difference between those two. Um, backing, which is what the, um, all of them together collecting and coll um, voting for it, you're never really going to do like really super, like what's it called? Like there's a limit to how well you can perform, right? Is that if there's all the weak learners, don't perform very well, it's not gonna do very well. Um, this is all kind of going voting. Boosting tends to be a little bit more interesting in the sense that um, you can essentially create very strong learners for very specific parts, but would be weak in other areas, and those would be combined together. So um, it's kind of an interesting put together. Bagging methods is relatively straightforward. Boosting, um, we'll talk about some of the disadvantages, but one big disadvantage for boosting is that it takes more time because you can't optimize as easily, okay? So I'm gonna start sharing my screen then. Um, and here we go. Share, there we go, okay. Cool, cool. All right, so uh, kind of going off like why ensemble ensembles. Um, so like I mentioned, you know, like combining things together to make one super learner. Um, I, I, I've said this joke like three different times. Does anyone know Captain Planet? Like, okay, a little bit, all right. I feel like I just, I'm gonna need something else, but in the show Captain Planet, for people who don't know, which is hilariously great. Um, it has a, has a great message, but um, each of these people, I don't know, like think Voltron or uh, Power Rangers, I guess. Something where each of these like little superheroes have their own special power, but their powers combine create the super superhero called Captain Planet, who kind of like can do all these crazy things that, you know, superheroes can do. Um, so that's how they kind of, essentially the show goes like, oh, there's a bad guy who's against like polluting or like who's um, for polluting the world in some weird way. Um, 
And then they all try to like fight him. It's like, oh, like, you know, like we can't beat him. And they're like, oh, let's combine their powers and create Captain Planet. So that's kind of like what ensemble methods are. Okay. Um, so our superpower here is that we decrease our variance. We're less likely to overfit. Um, basically, we're more likely to perform better. So again, think of decision trees. Um, decision trees tend to overfit. They're a really decent model, but they'll tend to overfit. So there's ways we can kind of combine maybe many, many decision trees together to perform better. And that's not just decision trees, but other models too. Like later on, we'll talk about support vector machines and other things too, okay? So oh, these two types, backing and boosting. So backing actually stands for, hmm, now I'm wondering if I have an old version. Oh, wait. Uh, backing actually stands for um, boost aggregation, um, or sorry, bootstrap aggregation. Um, and so the idea here is that we're going to use, you know, kind of like this randomness to basically build up multiple parts and combine them together. So it's kind of a fun way to kind of say this, like, hey, you start off with a decision tree. It's like, and you have a bunch of randomly selected decision trees, hey, you have a random forest. So one big uh, method for bagging is gonna be random forest. So let's talk about that now. All right, and while this loads, there we go. Minimize you, okay. So bagging, so bootstrap aggregation. So you can see bag. Um, it has nothing to do with actual bags and anything like that. Um, most things just like assume like in um, computers and like data science, usually they're just like abbreviations, okay? So um, the idea for bagging here is that we take weak learners, and we said like learners that, and I say weak, they could actually be very strong, like they're very good at their job. It's just that we consider them weak in the sense that we're gonna combine together to make a better um, learner. So we combine them together and we do it basically um, into one like super learner by voting, okay? So the way we can do this, for example, for bootstrap aggregation, imagine what bootstrap was. Remember bootstrap was essentially a way to randomly sample. We can basically pick different columns or pick, they pick different features and we say, okay, you are go you're gonna have these four features and you're gonna have these four random features. And you're gonna have these four random features and you can create multiple decision trees using each of those features. And what's nice, remember about decision trees is decision trees are deterministic. So no matter what you give it, it's always gonna give you, like if you get the same data, the same features, it's always gonna form the same exact way. So this random part allows us to basically create different decision trees with a little bit of variety and everything like that. And we create these multiple decision trees. So you see like this bootstrap sample, this is from the curriculum by the way. These bootstrap samples could be literally the different columns and you feed that information to each decision tree model and you combine them together to make your bagging model, okay? So, and that will be, turns out to be a random forest. So I'm gonna really focus on this random forest because um, I will uh, start off first is that like, if you ever start off with like whatever the supervised learning algorithm you, random forest is a good start. Um, usually random forest performs pretty well. And usually it takes some effort to actually do pretty decently. Um, you'd be surprised how many people will skip over random forest. They'll try something more advanced, like let's say like a neural network which will learn in mod six but it'll take something like a little neural network and it just doesn't perform very well compared to a random forest. Or it takes a lot of effort to get it to the same performance as a random forest. So a good kind of benchmark overall. Okay, so the good stuff, right? So one about a random forest combining multiple decision trees, it's like your super friend. It's kind of like they have all this, in, they have all this power from all these different decision trees. So it's high performance, it's low variance. So that means basically it tends to perform really well, but low variance, which means low, uh, less overfitting, right? And then what's nice about two is transparent. So um, one thing, I don't think I mentioned it directly last time, but one thing about decision trees is that you can actually rank the importance of the different splits. So you can say, what is the most important one? So you can say, what's the best, um, the highest feature importance? And so what's really cool is that random forest, it's using decision trees, which are very transparent and saying, you know, what are the different importance? It's actually really easy for us to look at a random forest and understand what are the most important features in that because it's inherited from decision trees. This is actually a really important aspect that is not always true for a lot of machine learning models. Um, you'll sometimes hear people refer to mach some machine learning models as a black box. Basically means you put data in, it puts out the results, but you don't really know why it made the decisions it did. Like you can technically pull it apart and like see like the mathematics of what happened, essentially like the different like, you know, values and stuff, but like how it came to those values isn't always very clear. Where a decision tree, it's very clear how it does it because we know it's deterministic so we can see like the information gain and all that stuff. So um, it makes it really transparent and understandable. So the bad things. 
So as you might guess, um, some of the bad things, because we're using many, many decision trees, um, we have a lot of information to store. Essentially, we have many, many trees to plant, which means you have many, many plants to store. Um, it's computationally expensive. And what I mean by this is that you have to train each of those decision trees. So you don't just train one decision tree. You're now training a bunch of different decision trees. Now, generally, each decision tree is going to have a smaller set of features than if you did all of the features together. But you still have to compensate that with many decision trees, which means it's just going to take more time for it to compute. Um, also, like I said, there's many trees to plant. So essentially what's going to happen is that we have a lot of memory. We have to store all of those trees, right? So we have to store all of those models together. Um, and now we have to, in order to apply this information, we have to basically apply each decision tree to the data and then have it vote at the very end. So you can imagine this is gonna take up a lot of space and memory. So uh, I kind of made this note, think back to K nearest neighbors. K nearest neighbors, you have to store all the information in order to make the predictions. And here you have to keep all the decision trees. There's no shortcut to do this. Okay, cool, yeah. Um, so this is kind of like the disadvantage of it. But you know, as a first kind of try, especially on like a data science computer, where you have available space and stuff like that, and you want to just test out the benchmark, um, this is a good kind of place to start off. Okay. Cool. Any questions so far? I kind of kind of zoomed through this pretty quickly, but um, like this bootstrap, you know, how this combines um, decision trees into um, uh, this random forest and the advantages and disadvantages. Everything? Cool. All right. So subspace sampling method. So. Um, the idea here is subspace, meaning that basically it's part of the whole sample itself, right? So um, the subspace of the full data set, the training data set. And so I kind of make this analogy of banana trees. So who, first of all, who likes bananas? Bananas? No one? Okay, good. Jenny's like, ah. all right, yeah. My, my wife's the same way. She doesn't, she's not a huge fan of bananas. Um, like, she just doesn't like the taste. But um, some fun stories about banana trees. It's just going to be really kind of seem off topic, but it'll all come back together. So some things about banana trees is that they're really susceptible to Panama's disease, which is a fungus. Um, and the reason why they're really susceptible to each other is because they're all clones. Essentially, every banana you ever had, unless it's like a plantain, but pretty much I nearly guarantee you that literally every banana you've ever had is the same um, genetic uh, variation. So it's the same like clone. It's not like it's like, oh, it's the same species. Like, no, it's literally a clone of each other. And so decision trees are kind of the same way. Is that if you gave it the same uh, data set, they literally would produce the same decision tree. So they're clones of each other if you give the same subset. So kind of quick story about um, the banana tree, OK? So um, does anyone ever eat like, usually like Laffy Taffy with like the, the artificial banana flavor? Like if you ever have a candy with artificial banana flavor, do you ever like taste that and realize like it does not taste like a banana? Like it, it tastes banana-like, but it doesn't taste like a real banana. Okay, do you guys know what the reason for that is? Other than the fact that it's artificial. So there's some history to this. So it turns out that the banana flavor is not based off of the banana we eat today. So the banana we eat today is the Cavendish uh, banana. And there was another, another banana, a sweeter banana. Some would argue a better tasting banana um, that was back before, I think, 1950s. And um, people would use this and they would use it all the time. Um, I think it was called the Michelson or Michaels, so, something Michelson or it's Michaels. Um, I, I probably looked this up. But anyway, this banana uh, was the preferred banana. It was out of the world. However, Panama's disease, a strain of Panama's disease, basically killed off all of the Michaels, uh, Michaels, Michelson banana, this better banana. And that's actually where the flavor came from. It's like they based it off of that old banana when they developed artificial flavor for bananas. Um, and so it killed off this whole banana set, so they had to create these whole new trees. So there's actually a huge concern now because we do see Pan Panama's disease in fields. When they actually have find this, this fungus in the field, they literally burn the whole field because they don't even want to risk, you know, having any um, spread of the disease itself. So one thing we can do is that they're actually looking at saying, you know, could we genetically modify bananas to, say, get more genetic variety so that way they're less susceptible to Panama's disease um, and maybe have a better taste in banana too. So, we do the same thing with decision trees, essentially when we create a random forest. So here's the basic steps of like how we create these different decision trees. Okay, so one is that we basically take a portion of the data for validation. So we call this out of bag. So the idea here is we're taking some of the data and putting off to the side, right? We're used to this like with cross validation. And the rest of the, the, rest of the data, in the bag is used for training. Then we take that data, the training data for the bag, and we split it up and randomly select different predictors or basically different features. 
Okay, so essentially we have like this set of data, right? That's completely separate with all these different features. And we say, okay, you're gonna select feature A, feature B, and feature Q. And we take those um, parts and say, okay, we're gonna feed this to one decision tree. And then we take another random sample and feed it to another decision tree. And essentially we use our grow or train our uh, decision tree from that randomly sampled bag, right? Of features. And we use that to create our new decision tree. Then we use our, our validation sets, so the stuff that's never seen before. It was never randomly sampled out of this bag. And you basically use that to, um, sorry, you use this validation set, take out the columns used in our tree from the previous step and predict using that tree. So the idea here is that you say, okay, like how well does this tree that we just grew, how well does it perform? And then also take out the columns used in the tree to see if we can get a new tree on top of that. And then what we can do is say, okay, let's see how well it performed. And if it performs really well, we can actually kind of keep increasing our, keep doing this over and seeing how well our error kind of increases and changes. And basically we just keep repeating this over and over and creating um, new decision trees. And they essentially just vote for the final decision. So if you imagine like tree A, tree B, tree C, if tree A and tree B vote for, oh, this would be class zero. And then the other one class, class one, it would be class, class by this class zero. So the idea here is that um, it's kind of like the wisdom of the crowd is that no one tree has seen all the data, but we can kind of like um, use that validation say, well, how well did it perform? And then we can combine all those together. So collectively they've seen all of the data and they um, made decisions off of that data. Um, but hopefully that prevents or overfitting. That makes sense? Okay, so that's kind of like a very quick like overview. I think the curriculum goes through a lot more detail on that. Um, Question I have a question about, um, yeah, mm -hmm. so why do we take out the columns that were used in the tree from the previous step? Right, so one thing we want to do is that we don't want to have literally like a double of the same tree over and over again. So we want to double check that like, um, what's it called? We want to make sure like we aren't predicting off of just those columns by themselves. And so like we don't end up like using the same thing over and over. We want it more random. We want a little more, um, we basically want to prevent overfitting, which means we're going to technically make the decision, the overall random forest perform worse than if it had known all the columns, but that's okay because we figured that it would perform, it would tend to overfit anyway. So we're essentially trying to like, like essentially cripple it a little bit. We're trying to make sure it doesn't perform as well like each decision tree doesn't perform super well by itself. So. And the columns are the features. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So this is kind of like a really um, brief going through. I think the curriculum kind of goes through a lot more details. And honestly, what's nice too is that you wouldn't necessarily write this out from scratch in general. You usually would have a scaler and do this uh, package for you. Okay. So why would this be beneficial? We kind of talked a little bit, it's just less over, overfitting. We have more variety. So that basically the idea is that with more variety between the different decision trees, we'll tend to have less overfitting. Okay, cool. All right, so everyone get the concept of that? I think that's relatively like understandable. Yeah, cool. All right, so some code stuff. So just kind of show you a little bit what this looks like. This is the random forest classifier. Um, I will note. I will note that um, you can actually do regression too with random forest or decision trees. Um, but just know that um, in this case, we're just kind of focusing on classifier because that makes the most sense. So just kind of looking at um, these different parts, you can see already there's very similar hyperparameters: max depth, min sample split, and these are basically for each of those trees. So each of those trees have certain hyperparameters, or have the hyperparameters that you feed it for the random forest. Okay. And you can see already, I think there's an example code right here. Yeah. So you can already see is that this guy right here, you're importing it. Um, and then this is the actual code to create that decision tree, or so that random forest. And then we fit it with this classifier.fit xy. So you can see already is that we're sklearn. Sklearn is really good at just like making things very like understandable in the sense that like, um, every classifier is gonna have this dot fit. Um, turns out this is something called an estimator, okay? And you can see here is that when you do this dot fit, it'll also return the classifier and say what those different uh, hyperparameters are. So note that basically most of these are default since they only put in three of these parts in here. And then also at the very end, after you fit it, right, you can make predictions. So you can say, okay, there's, um, in this case, it looks like a four dimensional um, 
input. So there's four features for this thing, and it can predict which class it is on here. Also, I have notice, noticed the feature importance is you can see basically which one's the most important of those features. So feature zero, feature one, feature two, feature three. And you can see here in this case, it turns out feature one in this case is the most important aspect. So most decisions will probably be determined by just that uh, feature one. Okay. Cool. All right. So yeah, I'll kind of leave it at that part, but you can kind of see a little bit. Um, I like to show the documentation to kind of just show where this comes from and where you can kind of look things up as you kind of like try to find different character parameters and stuff. Um, yeah. So that is bagging. Um, and so I'll move on then to the next one, which is boosting methods. So um, boosting methods, I think, is a little, um, oh, I didn't say one advantage for a bagging method, is because you're growing all these different trees. Um, if you, none of, I'm assuming none of you all are farmers, but I think you guys can probably understand this, right? Is that you wouldn't grow one tree and then have a banana, and, and then the next year, like, cool, I got bananas now, and then grow a new tree. And say, oh, look, I have a new banana, right? And grow a new tree, that would take you forever, right? What would you do? You, you'd plant all these seeds at once, right? So you can imagine here is that random forest is really useful in the sense that you, even though you have to trade many, many decision trees, you can do this, what we call in parallel. Basically, we can say, grow this tree, grow this tree, grow this tree, ready, set, go, and it grows all of them at the same time. So the idea there is that you can um, expand this really quickly. Uh, you can train very, relatively quickly, um, even though it's technically computation expensive, it's easy to scale up. We'll see that's not going to be the case for boosting. Okay, so for boosting. So the idea here again is we're combining many weak learners to create a strong learner. So kind of similar to backing. But this case we're using something called sequential learning. So the idea here is that we basically iteratively improve from the previous learner. So if you think back to my uh, analogy with um, them taking a test, you can think of like student A, you know, who's very good, like, you know, let's say in science. Um, does the test and then we say, okay, student A got these ones, or likely got these ones right, or they got these ones right. Okay, student B comes in and says, all right, well, what are the ones that student A got wrong? And focuses on just the ones that student A got wrong, instead of taking the whole test through, right? And the idea there is that we basically are looking at what the errors, like what errors the first learner did and using those errors to basically increase and enhance the next learner. Make sense? Okay, so we'll see that we actually can't do this in parallel. Um, some disadvantages, <coughs> like I said, um, this relies on improving from the previous learner, which means it can't be parallelized, which means it can't scale very well. When we say something can't scale very well, that means that like, we can't just simply just throw new computers at it to essentially um, um, increase its speed. Essentially, in order for it to perform better, it needs to, <coughs> excuse me, um, it needs to uh, have basically it has to just learn and train faster. So if you can't get your thing to train faster, which basically means better hardware, it can't scale anymore. So essentially there's a limit to how fast you can train versus like random forest, like, oh, it takes, you know, let's say one second to train each decision tree. Um, but there's like a hundred decision trees in this one random forest. Well, we can run a hundred different, you know, little computers to train that one tree for one second. So the whole overall process would take around one second versus if it takes you know, one second for each um, learner for this um, boosting method, is that if you have to wait one second and then wait one second to do that one, and then wait one second for the next one, the next one, next one, next one, you have 100 learners now, it's gonna take you 100 seconds. The only way to make that faster is basically to improve that training part where maybe instead of taking one second, it takes half a second. But that means you have to get a better computer. You can't just simply have another computer start work on the same problem. Okay. So some terminology, but I think that's kind of useful to think about. Um, so the main methods that we're going to talk about, there's many different uh, boosting methods, uh, but we're mostly going to talk about AdaBoost here and Gradient Boost. Um, I think the curriculum also mentions about XGBoost. Um, note XGBoost is a type of Gradient Boosting. It's just that it's been optimized um, as a package. So if you understand Gradient Boosting, you more or less will understand like how XGBoost works. Um, I've had people ask like, you know, how does actually boost work? And I'm like, well, there's a bunch of optimizations you can do, which basically ends up being like, there's not a way to like easily implement it from scratch because essentially you'd be recreating XG boost. So just kind of keep that in mind. Okay. So any questions so far of this overview of boosting methods? Cool. All right. So 
some explanations. So first one's Ada Boost. So this is a very common one. This was developed, um, I, no, I'm not gonna get the year right, but it was developed um, at some point in the past um, and created basically Ada Boost. So it's a very popular one. It's relatively understandable. Um, I'm gonna kind of glaze over some of the mathematics of like, for example, the voting section, um, but that's because you definitely don't have to know, just know that it combines it together. So the basic algorithm here, as this is from the curriculum as well, is that we basically train the model. So we take some weak learner, we train the model, and then we say, okay, you made these errors. Go ahead and basically um, increase those errors or inflate those errors. Basically say, hey, like really point out those errors. So I think like a teacher being like, like, oh, like, or think of like a parent maybe would be a better one. It's like, oh, you got these ones right, but these ones you got wrong. You need to try better to get these ones right. Essentially, that's what's happening here. It's saying increasing that error so it pays attention to those. Um, these errors increase in weight to basically make it so that it did it essentially performed a 50-50 split of like basically not performing well. So imagine like basically it's equivalent to like you guessing and then basically retrain the model again, right, using errors. And note that when I say retrain the model, I mean like you keep this first model here, you train it, you put it off to the side, and then you retrain a new model and keep that new model when it performs and keep that off to the side. And then you'll combine them all together to create one super learner. Does that make sense? Okay, but the key part, this is why you have to do um, sequential right here, is, is inflating the errors. Basically, it's learning from the previous learner's mistakes. So this is kind of like a little process going through here that the curriculum wrote, is that you imagine like this uh, pluses and minuses, right? So red and blue here, um, you can think of like this is the original data set. So they're equal weighted. So basically it tries to make a cut right here. It says, okay, well, it makes a cut in this case right here. And says this is like the best way it could make this cut. Um, in this case, imagine our learner just able to make one single line. Like that's all it's able to do. So nothing too fancy, but you can imagine this learner could actually be a little more advanced. But the idea here is like, okay, it's gonna make just one line. And the best line in this case is gonna be right here where basically it makes, it makes three errors in the blue side. But if it made any other like cut, like for example, it made a cut right here, you know, it would still basically make mistakes here. So essentially this is the best case scenario for it. So it takes this part, it says, okay, well you made these three errors. So let's go ahead and keep this model off to the side, bring it off to the side and say, okay, let's increase the errors here. So like make these weights even larger. So the errors will really matter here. And we bring it to a new model. So you can see here is that these uh, are represented with higher errors with these huge pluses. Okay, and then we basically, okay, go ahead and still using like a simple model, right? One single line, make a line that best splits this up. So before, if it made a split right here, like before without this increasing, you'd see it basically make one, two, three mistakes as well. So like, oh, it wouldn't really matter. But because these are so large, this is gonna be saying, well, these are worth more. If I made a mistake on these ones, then I'm gonna be in real trouble. So the idea here is that, okay, it's gonna to try to, emphasize trying to not make the mistakes on these uh, blue parts and you make this new model here, okay? And then you say, okay, now we say, all right, let's take these mistakes here or the mistakes it made on this case and let's go ahead and increase those errors. So this one, two, three errors, increase them, make them larger, right? Um, and so that way the next model will train off of these ones right here. And you can see here, makes a cut and you can see this one, two, three in this case are the three different errors that it has um, where it increased it. So now it's gonna make these one, two, three errors over here. So if we repeat this a fourth time, you can imagine inflating each of these ones to basically um, encourage the next model to try to not make those mistakes. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? Okay, cool. And then once you have all these models, you put them all together. And the idea here is they vote together. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the mathematics of voting, but more or less you can kind of imagine is that like the crossover here, for example, like if they both cross over in blue, like all three of them cross, cross over in blue right here, we'll call this blue, right? If you have a crossover, um, two out of three of them right here, so you can see like this top part right here, this middle section will be two of them will say that they're blue. We'll say, oh, that is blue. And we can say, okay, well, in this case, there are, this really should be red, I think. I don't know why it showed this as blue. Um, but anyway, it should essentially, okay, like there's two of them that are red, this would be the next color here, which if it did that, you could see it would actually be red. Um, and then you can see this middle part was definitely more red, and then on the right side was always red here. So that basically increases um, the chances. There's more variance from this very simple model. Okay, cool. And then the key part again is that they are sequentially improving each time. So um, 
there you go. Just combine weak learners. I used to have the mathematics on here. I I never talked about it well, so I kind of skipped over it because I think um, the curriculum kind of talks about it some more. If we want to, maybe we can talk about it in the future. But um, basically, just know that it combines these parts um, together in a voting system. Okay. <clears throat> so again, kind of going at um, what the um, <clears throat> excuse me. And it's because I have the regressor, um, but um, the actual code to create this, right? You can again see since we were importing this classifier, we create the classifier here, we fit it on that training data, and then we predict it. So you can see more or less the same thing. Like if I replace this with random forest, this would look pretty much the same, except for maybe uh, adjusting those hyperparameters. Okay. And then the hyperparameters, um, in this case, it's kind of cool. Is that the, one of the hyperparameters, because this can be done with different learners, you actually, one of the hyperparameters is actually um, the base learner. So you can see the base estimator is, in this case, a decision tree. But as we learn more about, um, what's it called? Um, like more different machine learning algorithms, you can actually feed in other machine learning algorithms in here besides the decision tree. So uh, next we'll learn about support vector machines. For example, you could feed in a support vector machine within here um, and that would use that support vector machine to train on each iteration. Okay. And then you can see n estimators is basically just saying how many estimators are they gonna use? Basically, how many sequences are we gonna move forward with? All right, sound good? Cool. All right, um, so any questions on ADA boosting on general concept? Pretty understandable. Right. And note that I try to avoid doing the mathematics because I think it's a little clear if we don't, we kind of avoid a little bit of like the math itself, like, you know, how does it do this part and stuff. Uh, the key part is that you can see here is that Ada Boost is basically going to take care of most of that for you. All right. So this leads us to our next um, boosting method called gradient boosting. So gradient boosting is a really interesting one. So this again is a um, uh, image from the curriculum. And basically the idea here, again, it's going to use each like iteration to improve further and further. What's kind of interesting is that um, we start off with some, you know, like um, this is the actual like data, the, the actual data points, right? And what we're going to do is that like, we train the model on here. And the model, this is not the best example of this, but like the model, oh wait, this is probably, sorry. I'm misinterpreting what the curriculum does. This is that this is what it really should look like. And what we're doing for this next one right here, so okay, we fit a model that's not gonna perform the best on it, right? There's gonna be some mistakes. So you can see it's a little off right here. Um, it's a little bit of, um, too low in this case, right? So it's you're not performing perfectly. So what we do for the next one, essentially, we take the residual saying how far were those data points from the actual model that we created and we train on those data points. So you can see this next um, black data points are literally the residuals from this tree. And we train the model again on top of this. And then we do that and say, okay, what are the residuals from this model? And we plot those points and then train a new model on top of that. And then we, at the very end, combine these models together. And essentially that will uh, create a better model overall. Okay, so the idea here is that we're boosting it forward, right? Essentially we're learning from the previous part. Um, does that make sense? Okay, cool. So the basic algorithm here, um, this is where like the math, I put a little math in here, but it's a lot easier than what, maybe what it looks like at first. So the main thing first is that we need a way to equate saying, what is the error? So mean squared error, right? I'm gonna minimize that gradient descent. So that's why gradient boosting. We're basically using gradient descent to essentially minimize this MSE error, okay? So each point will have some MSE and a goal is to minimize that as much as possible. Um, and the point is that we're going to use the residuals from the previous model to make an even better model to combine those together. So the way these steps work is that essentially we start off with our first model. So we'll call it F1. X is our data, right? And say, okay, we fit the model F1X, right? And this is going to make a prediction of Y. Okay. So this is essentially our Y right here. I'm sorry. Um, this is maybe not the best way to phrase this. I would maybe put this. This. There we go. We train our model and we'll call this, oh, I know I did wrong. All right, this should be y hat. That's what I was trying to write here, is that this is y hat here. This is our prediction for our model. And so what we're gonna do next, like, okay, we have our model and what we're gonna do is define our new residuals. To define the residuals, we just take the ground truth, y, the actual data, minus the predictions, right? So this would be equivalent to y hat right here, okay? And that will give us h1x, 
Okay. And then what we do is say, okay, we train our new model to basically figure out the best way to um, predict on this X and then we combine them together. So then essentially we have our new model, which will be FX2 or F2X is equal to that first model plus the model that predicts off the residuals. And then we basically subtract this off. And so we'd have new residuals on top of that. So essentially we can keep iterating further and further down into it. Okay. All right. So again, I think this visually makes sense it's kind of going this way, but this is how kind of how you would mathematically kind of write this out. So this is where I was kind of kicking myself earlier, as you guys kind of heard me. I have some, I had some code here and I must have not committed it, which makes me, just drives me crazy. But um, before we go into that, I might be able to clone some information here. Um, but here is the actual gradient boosted classifier from sklearn. Um, you can kind of see from the very bottom here, you can see all the hyperparameters. We see from the very bottom here, do they have an example code? I thought they did. Oh, that's why I wrote my own, duh. Okay, but essentially you use the same kind of thing, but you can see there's some main hyperparameters we have. For example, how do we calculate the loss, which is gonna be the thing that we minimize, the learning rate, because we're doing gradient descent, right? So we have to say what alpha is in this case, you know, how much is it going to, um, you know, take those steps down the hills um, and estimators, basically how many times are we gonna repeat this over and over and over, okay? And you can see there's other um, parts in here too, like all the different, uh, different hyperparameters, okay? So that is gradient boosting. Um, I kind of quickly went through this part, but any questions on just conceptually how this works? Okay, cool. And I think the really cool thing to note is that this is the residuals. It's learning basically how how far off is it? Like, like can it make a model to predict how far off it will be from the first model? And then from that part saying the second model, the second, in this case, tree here, is saying how far off is it from those mistakes? So essentially saying, you know, can you make a prediction on how much of a mistake you'll make? Um, so that's kind of like what the idea here is, and then combine them together. Victor, would you say that mm -hmm. gradient boosting is like faster than data boosting, data boosting? Mm -hmm. well, that's a tough one. I don't necessarily know if I would say it's faster. Um, hmm. Well, that's a tough one. I'd have to think about what would be best. I think it might depend on Yeah, I think it would have to depend on what kind of situation you're looking at. Um, and then, for example, like, do you, for example, stop at a certain point when you get a good enough model um, versus like saying how many estimators are? So like something I called early stopping. Um, it also depends what base estimator you have too. So you, you'll still have a base estimator here, but if you have different estimators in this case, it definitely will perform differently. Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. I would thinking yeah. like it goes right at the errors so mm -hmm. maybe it's just like a quicker model but I don't yeah I mean yeah that's a tough one because um it's tough to judge exactly like I I'm sure someone would actually know like what the more specifics but I think it would really depend on not so much how the models train but calculating these errors and then training off those models and that's where um I think I mentioned xg boost xg boost tries to optimize a lot of these steps to help it go faster and perform better. Um, they do a lot of really interesting things in that package um, that, to be honest, it's a little bit beyond me even um, to go through it. If you ever like look at seeing like, you know, how XG Boost works, um, it's pretty, it's pretty like, it's interesting, but it definitely is like not something super intuitive by itself. Okay. So, um, all right, so I'm gonna see if I can, I had code, I'm, I don't know what happened to me. I'll, I'll make sure to show you guys the video um, that I had recorded for another cohort of like that section of the coding part. Um, but I based it off of um, the one who wrote hands-on machine learning. Uh, Jenny, you were able to pronounce the name. Can you pronounce her, his name for me? <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming, yeah, it's a, okay. a French looking name. So I'm just assuming that it's Aurelien mm -hmm. Giron. Yes, yeah. that's probably right. Jaron, yeah. Jaron? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I've heard him and like, he, he speaks like, you know, like I don't hear any accent in his English at all. And then when he says his name, I'm like, whoa, like I'm like, I wasn't ready for that, you know, like French accent. Um, so 
Um, it always really throws me off. I try, but I I feel bad when I can't pronounce names because <laughs> uh, it's someone's name. Someone's like a name. All right, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and use MP Viewer on this. Take this far. So. Um, Surprise, surprise. Uh, I will use a lot of um, Jaron's uh, code here because um, he does a great job. It's all available free online. Um, so this is actually the code from his uh, book itself, the Hands-On Machine Learning uh, book. And uh, what's nice is that it's all free available. It's, to be honest, to do this without the book, it's a little hard to understand like what exactly is going on. He does all right, but he's not trying to put in the, co the comments in there to just for you to look on this by itself. But it, I think it's good enough. So um, I was just going to show you guys a little bit of what's going on here. So um, he is showing in this case, I'm kind of going to skip over to uh, the boost or the gradient boosting part. He shows some thing. Okay, gradient boosting. So this is what I wanted to show you guys is that, all right, forgive me guys, because I, I was able to take some of this code and like kind of reformat it into something more specific grade boosting. So I kind of have to read this a little bit. So he's just basically creating some random data here. So you can kind of see in this case, it looks like a polynomial data. So quadratic data right here with some random noise and everything like that. Um, and then we, he's just showing how to make this first prediction. So he basically creates this decision tree. So he's going to use a decision tree regressor. So remember in this case, because we're looking at residuals, we're looking at regression, right? And so he's creating this decision tree regressor, um, just these specific hyperparameters. He fits it on this part. So that's his first regressor. Then he says, all right, what's fine? let's find the residuals of this, which is the original data minus the prediction from that very first model, right? And then it's gonna create his new, um, his new tree here, new decision tree, tree reg two. And he fits it on not um, taking that X points, but the predictions now are predicting off the residuals. So he's trying to predict the residuals based on this X, okay? And then he takes that information and feeds it into his next model, where he says, OK, let's take the residuals of the residuals. So this was the residuals here. This is basically the difference from that model. So it's the residuals of the residuals. Okay, And then he basically repeats that same process here. Okay, So you can see he fits in on there. And so now he's just kind of showing a little bit, um, let's see here, x new. He's just showing like uh, uh, making a prediction and stuff like that and seeing how well it performs. Um, and you can see is this case, he is doing a tree predict. So what's happening here is that because each prediction is going to predict a number, the residuals, um, he's predicting that how much is it off. So you can imagine this first tree regulation, uh, reg one, is going to say 0.8 and it's going to put in the numbers of, oh, it should be 0.7, right? And then the tree reg two is going to say, okay, that is going to predict off of x nu, this 0.8 is going to say, how much of a mistake did you make? And it's gonna estimate something like, oh, you made a mistake of, you know, a point, let's say 0.1. So the idea here is like the first one, I'm gonna just draw it here since I'll lose track of me saying it out loud. You can say, imagine this tree regressor right here. I'm just making this up. When it feeds in point A, it says, oh, it should be 0 0.7. Okay. And then it says, okay, let me try the next regressor, right? The tree regressor here. And it says, okay, from this 0 0.8 feed, it assumes you're going to make a mistake of one, uh, 0 0.1. All right. And then the tree regressor, the third one says, oh, your mistake, so you predicting the mistake is going to be off. It's going to say so make a prediction of, oh, it's off by negative 0 0.05. So you overestimated that mistake. So for at least this value right here. So it goes negative 0.05. And so the idea here is that you sum up all these values here. Basically, this is what it thinks the first time is. This is how much it thinks the mistake is going to be off. And this is going to say how much it thinks that mistake is going to be off. Okay, so this added up together. You know, I, I just made up these numbers, but it would be like 0 0.75. So that would be the overall prediction using these three um, estimators. And that's how you get, like, in this case, the prediction of 0 0.75. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's kind of like the subsequent tree. The first tree, or the first, the first predictor says, I think it's going to be 0 0.7. And then the others mm -hmm. say, I think you're going to, like, each mm -hmm. subsequent one kind of taps it one way or another. And so they're all contributing mm -hmm. one number at the end. OK. That's right. And right. You but can the, think the subsequent of it. ones aren't making their own guess. They're making a guess about how far off. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can kind of, yeah. <laughs> cool. I, 
awesome. And this is where like, you can imagine like, let's say, let's like, we're playing a game, let's say, okay, Jenny's gonna guess a number, you know, guess this number. And Jenny goes, I think it's 0 0.7. And then I goes like, well, I don't know what the actual number is, but I think Jenny is gonna be off in general by 0 0.1. And then Andy goes like, well, I think Victor is gonna be off from guessing what, how off Jenny is off by 0 0.05. And so we add up all those numbers together, essentially, and that creates the actual prediction. Okay, yeah. So it's kind of strange, but I think it's one of those things where like, like, I don't know how, like it, I honestly, I don't think I would have thought of doing that, but it makes a lot of sense, I think, once you kind of say, oh, okay, it's predicting how basically far off each one is, okay? So that's what he's showing right here, is he's combining all those regressors together. Um, this is more or less by scratch. So you note that he's not using any actual like, like package to do this, right? So he's just basically using tree regressors on each regressive line. Um, he he didn't write. Right? He could use to do this. He could use he used like XG boost to do something like this for sure. Yeah. So, um, but he's just kind of showing it by hand of like how this works. And so he actually shows a little visual here of each step. So you can see here is the original data, right here. And basically this uh, first one is the first um, prediction. And this on the right side is the overall model. So this is kind of think of like every model added up together. So the first time we only have one model. So you can see it's kind of off right here. And then basically it says, okay, how far off you are. So you can see this underperformed, right? So the model should have a negative residual. So you can see here in that same X value here, it's a negative residual. And these ones it guessed over, right? So you see it's a positive residual. And then these ones right here, these are slightly under. So these are negative residuals. So you can kind of see those, how this residual um, came up. And then you say, okay, let me, make, let me make this new model, H2 of X1. And so it tries to predict on here, and then it combines this model and this model to create this model here. And you can kind of see here is that in this model, it says, hey, you're off on this part. Like you can see it's right here. It's usually off by 0 0.2. So what's gonna happen, it's gonna boost this guy up, right, by 0 0.2. So it's gonna be like right about here, and you can see that's what happens right there. Is that you guys see the difference there? Yeah, so you can kind of see that that's essentially boosting up like it's mistakes. And then it says, okay, how many mistakes did you make here? And it fits that last model. So you can kind of see a little bit. Um, it's a little harder to see because there's less mistakes necessarily. Yeah, I actually can't. <laughs> I don't see it actually performing too differently from the, the very last one. But you wouldn't expect it to, right? Because like it's making slight mistakes smaller and smaller. You can see most of the residuals are very close to the beginning. The only thing it changes is probably like right here, which is probably why you see this little change. Oh, you do see a change right here. Okay, cool. So yeah, that's kind of how it combines together. And again, this is where you can actually import, you know, he's showing you like how you do it from scratch. And then you can also actually use this gradient boosting regressor from sklearn. So you don't have to literally do all those parts and you feed it saying how many, um, in this case, this is a tree, right? A decision tree. So it's saying, oh, what's the max depth? Estimator's three, giving a learning rate, and then just giving a random state. And then he kind of shows a little bit what this looks like. Um, note on this side right here, he is probably overestimating, or not overestimating, overfitting. Okay, so one thing you can do in this case is actually do something called early stopping. And so early stopping basically says, okay, like you can see we start with three estimators, and then we go up to 200. Well, since it's sequential, right, it's kind of like time. It's like, well, if we keep making more and more estimators, right, we can say, well, at a certain point, we could stop it right there. So in this case, he actually gives it, um, kind of looking through a little bit. <laughs> but um, the idea with early stopping is that he would start with 120, and then he would eventually stop when it gets to a certain point. So you can see here, in this case, it gets to 55. Let's see. Yeah. Do you know where he put that in? I'm trying to look right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, min error. GBR not fit. Okay. So since each one, yeah. Okay. So since each one is like, if you think about like gradient boosting, it's combining many models in the very end together. You can basically sequentially go through at the very end and say, okay, let me go and train it with 120 and basically keep going through each one. Um, at the very end here and stop it from here. So like what he does, he actually does train it with all 200, is that, no, sorry, all 120 um, estimators. So he basically does this part right here, this dot fit, and this dot fits, like, okay, this is already trained, like nothing we can change at this point. But he says, okay, let's find what the errors are for each individual estimator. 
And basically saying, okay, let's find the mean squared value for that um, y val versus y prediction. And then this is the actual, uh, this G, GBRT is his gradient boosting regression. Um, I don't know what he's calling it, this with the T, but basically this is his gradient boosting regressor, his, his model. And he's saying, okay, for each stage uh, predicted. So like each, this has a special function that can basically look at each prediction going forward. And so he's just saying what the error is for each of those predictions. And then says, okay, let's basically have a minimum error. So basically like, when do we stop it at this point? And so that's what he's graphing right here is saying, okay, well, at, um, I'm trying to see where it is, this minimum error, plop, plop. All right, if I if I looked at this beforehand, <laughs> maybe I'll tell you guys ahead of time. Okay, here's plot prediction. So oh, he made a function that's here too. That's gonna essentially he's gonna pull up this best. Yeah, but the idea here is that he has a minimum error of like when this error starts increasing. So this validation error, so you can see right here, is that you can say okay when the error starts increasing in this case, that's where we should stop it. And but it has to train it all the way through. So note that like this is going through all the different predictors. And I think he might actually show this where, no, he doesn't show it on here. Okay. Um, okay, so this is, so the problem with this, uh, you guys can kind of see this right now. What's the problem with this big guy right here? Because um, this is the best model. He kept going for all that time after he yeah. found the best one. You know, look at all that waste of time, just sitting on the computer waiting for something to happen, right? Um, where really he could have just stopped right here. So that's where this bottom part right here, you can notice he creates the regressor here for the actual like model, right? And then he starts training it, but he does basically for N estimators in one to 120. So note that basically there is no N estimators here. And essentially what he's gonna do here is he's gonna manually fit it through. So he basically goes through this over and over again. And then if the, um, let's see here, let's see here, else are going up. It's like if error is going up by a certain value, up by five in this case, then it's going to break. So this is going to when he stops right here. So you can see in this case, it stops at 61. So this is kind of a little bit of how you can optimize some stuff. So you can imagine, you know, doing all this stuff. This is where things like XGBoost can be really important. Say, hey, XGBoost does a lot of extra stuff. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the overall code, uh, some code example of how you would kind of implement this. Okay. Any questions? I know we're kind of over our time for this, though I guess we're going to support vector machines next, so not a big deal, right? <laughs> I have a quick question. Yeah, go for it. So like something like gradient boosting, like let's say <laughs> for like this one where it's just kind of like a parabola and you can kind of like see like looking at your data, that's just a parabola. Mm -hmm. Are there any benefits of using like something like gradient boosting over just like a polynomial regression? Yeah, so one is that gradient boosting can perform like this is a relatively, like you said, like a parabola. It's like, oh, it's a parabola. Like, I could just simply like do a polynomial regression. Um, a lot of times it's not as clear cut as this and it's more complicated shapes. So imagine if you had data that looked more or less, uh, I'm trying to like give an example. That's not, that's a bad example. But like imagine something like that, right? Like the data t tends to flow this weird part. This is a multi-polynomial um, part. So in order to do a polynomial regression, like, well, you know, and this is only for 2Ds or for 2D, right? So you can imagine like if you had like, you know, let's say X1 and X2, or let's say just Y, okay? Just for a Y and X1 here, you say, okay, how many polynomials do we need? It's like, do we need a degree of like 10, 20, 30? Then you have to figure out, you have to consider all of those X1, X1 squared, X1 uh, cubed and so on. So you have to decide, like you could technically figure out like, oh, well this should be a polynomial degree of five, you know, and that should be perfectly fine for us to be able to say, well, we don't need X2, you know, cause I know it's not gonna include X2, but you can already see that this is gonna take a lot of effort just for one feature. So imagine if you have multiple features and you can't simply plot this out in one dimension, that's when it gets complicated where polynomial regression, it's like, it's like you could technically try to feed it a lot of different options, but then you also risk the chance of overfitting. So this is where essentially machine learning models here is like, instead of you deciding what model for you to teach it, if this makes sense, that's what uh, linear uh, polynomial regression, you have to decide what the theory is, what the model looks like. Instead you say, all right, computer, you figure out what the model's gonna look like and just give it hyperparameters. Does that make sense, Andy? Yeah, it does. I mean, I was just wondering for like a really like mm -hmm. simple situation, would it 
you know, like, would you even bother trying to do any sort of like linear regression or anything? Or is it better to just like now at this yeah. point, just already just jump to like gradient boosting since. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. There and it's probably easier. I would probably say is this is where I'll probably people will argue with me either way. Um, there are people who say you should try linear regression if like just as the first initial part to see how well it performs and it performs really well just with simple linear regression. Cool. Um, if you know what the model should look like, you can do polynomial regression or linear regression even and feed it in there and see how it performs. In practice, it usually won't be as simple as that. So usually like these machines like you have to use a more advanced ml technique like either grain boosting or decision trees i say decision trees are a nice kind of like go to because they're relatively simple to kind of see you can also do a regression with the decision trees and usually just see how well it performs um and usually i say decision trees mean like a random forest um but yeah usually in general if you know the data or is it data super simple try linear regression just see how well it performs uh, you might just be perfectly fine doing that. Or if you already know what, like, say, oh, I know it's quadratic, so I'm just going to basically fit a model to y equals x squared, you know, and go from there. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and start recording here, and then we'll move on to support vector machines.